fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back to the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. And I'm Kev Thompson. We've got the uh, lovely <laughs> Aphrodite Jones with us. And uh, we're going to be talking about her new uh, edition of the uh, Michael Jackson Conspiracy Book. And there's all sorts of things in there. There's uh, special videos and everything. So uh, welcome to the show, Aphrodite. Thank you, guys. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Always. <laughs> it, it, it already has been. Yeah. Well, yeah. you guys are fun for sure. Well, and you've got some theories that I like. That's, that I know. Yeah, well, that's what we do. And we like to have fun with it because, you know, it's it's a serious subject and uh, most of the time. And we want to be a little bit relaxed with it. But we'll see what happens. Maybe mm -hmm. L.A. will get it. Okay. Um, now, <laughs> <laughs> they might not like it. Um, so now you're re redoing this book. Now, what's, what's the deal with... Um, the Michael Jackson all of a sudden being in, you know, because ABC did that um, right, thing. Right. And they're being sued now for infringement, right? Uh, well, it's interesting. The ABC, uh, what was the last days of Michael Jackson, uh, did use some footage of him, you know, in his Pepsi commercial and, and different footage of him as a ch young man, you know, trying to break out on his own and talking um, to Diane Sawyer, to Barbara Walters. I think the public interest in Michael Jackson, I mean, right now there's a Pepsi can coming out with Michael Jackson on it. So the public interest in Michael Jackson has been revived because of his music. I mean, let's face it, this man's music is still some of the best music that anybody, you know, can listen to on the planet. Um, the dance music, the dance routines, the videos, uh, you know, they still stand out. They still, wherever you go, you're going to hear a Michael Jackson song at some point, and people are going to be happy and, and dance. And kids, I mean, between Thriller be, being connected to Halloween these days, I mean, it's become a commercial enterprise beyond anything I think he dreamed of in his lifetime. I think they're making billions of dollars, the estate, from it. And people are obsessed with the music, obsessed with the person, and they want to know more about Michael Jackson. Because now, 13 years after the man was exonerated, and it'll be next year, 10 years since his death, people are realizing that this, this talent has gone from the planet, and, and we're, we're never seeing the likes of him so far again. But on that um, special, I don't know if you saw it, I saw it, it was... Um... I thought. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I I I liked it. I I don't know. I didn't I didn't come out of it with anything new. No, there wasn't anything particularly new about it. Honestly, um, you know, we already knew about obviously Conrad Murray and and AEG and 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 how they you know hired Murray for him at his insistence and and we knew about the Pepsi commercial and we knew about how that started his devolution into uh, painkillers, and, and they showed the videos of Michael, you know, saying that I've gone for treatment, and the later one asking for his day in court. What I found interesting and curious was that they included Diane Diamond throughout the piece yeah. as one of the main commentators about Michael Jackson, and you know that she spent her, a large part of her career trying to destroy Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was um, an odd choice. <laughs> I thought it was a horrible choice, you know, especially since this is supposed to be a Jackson, and she she did not say anything negative about him in the piece, but every Michael Jackson fan knows that she was the number one forerunner for, right, she had written a book, uh, which was Chiron in the piece, um, 
trying to prove his guilt. She was ready with Tom Snedden to be the first one to get, you know, access to the jail if, if Jackson had been put in jail after the trial. I mean, she was let on Neverland during the raid, the police raid on Neverland with hard copy. I mean, she was obsessed with finding Michael Jackson guilty and putting him behind bars and, and helping convict him in the media and the court of public opinion, and yet they use her in the ABC documentary that's supposed to be you know, non-biased against Michael Jackson. Yeah. I, I, I just, yeah. I was stunned to see her and see so much of her there. Yeah, and, and let's let's back up for just a moment though, because you said something there that's almost, almost, and Al, you know to expect this of me, almost <laughs> reeks of conspiracy. Why would she be allowed during the raid? That that is police procedure. That is, you know, we're collecting evidence here. Why is she allowed to even be anywhere near it? Well, that's it. Point. She was allowed on the grounds of Neverland. And the reason is clear, because she and Tom Snedden had a pact. Because Tom Snedden, and I spoke to the police in Santa Barbara at the time of the trial and asked them uh, an elusive question. And they answered to it about whether or not he would be found guilty. And the answer came back, either way, we've accomplished what we've wanted to. In other words... It was more important or as important to them to convict him in the public eye and in the media than it was to put him behind bars. Yes, that is what they really more, wanted. And that's what they got. Image. It was more image than litigious. Exactly. In other words, Snedden obviously wanted to have him behind bars. But the rest of the police force that were behind it weren't so interested to see him behind bars, but to make sure that the public... Would never, he would never, right, as you say, image, have this, have an, a good image again, that he would be destroyed. And, and they managed to destroy him. And Diane Diamond was part and parcel to it. Because she's the first one on, loud on the, on the Neverland property during the raid to have that access. And she was the forerunner during the entire trial of only, only promoting things about his guilt, of never talking about anything that was exculpatory, of being very one-sided. She was fired by Court TV immediately after the trial, and her book was a flop. Yeah. Uh, but why do you, why do you think she was after Michael so much? Like, what, what was her, what was in it for her? Yeah, I think what was in it for her was, imagine if you could take down the biggest superstar in the world almost single-handedly. Right. right. Imagine the, the journalistic reputation you would gain if you could somehow facilitate that. Right. She would have solidified her place in, you know, journalistic icons it, at least that's what she was hoping to do. Mm. That, that's uh, what would be the reason. I understand your theory, but let me disagree just a little bit. Okay, yeah, you would gain a, an incredible reputation if you took some, took down somebody that at that time was negative in the world's eyes. You know, if you could, you know, but this was Michael Jackson. Why would you go after the world's darling? That would well, just he wasn't, make you No, 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 he wasn't. wasn't at that time, was he? No, he wasn't. I, he was already at that point. I the, Oh, well. I mean, okay. <laughs> is that it, it may seem strange, but there was a confidential report that allowed Diane Diamond to think she was going to have a career, that she was going to wind up with you know, this huge career because she is the one who broke his alleged predilection for underage boys back in 1993. So she is the one who wanted to finish that. I got you. Okay. Yeah. She wanted to put the final nail in it. Right. She wanted to start it and end it. So even though it was hard copy of Trashy, she's the one in 1993 that was assigned to find out why the cops raided Neverland, and she found out that she got a, she got a confidential child welfare report on Jordy Chandler from a police source that slipped that to her. So in her mind, she had, in my opinion, a vendetta. Just the same as Tom Fenn did, and the two of them started to work in consort. 
Because then a decade later, more than a decade later, where is she? She's in court outside Santa Maria, and, you know, basically is is doing everything she can to uh, make sure the public understands that Michael Jackson is guilty, even though inside the courtroom, that's not what was happening. Yeah, well, she almost had me convinced. I mean, I'm saying this on air. I was literally shocked whenever the verdict came back, not guilty. I, I was mm-hmm. certain at that point, and, and I was a huge Michael Jackson fan. With, you know, going back to my earlier mm-hmm. statement, I in my eyes, he was still the world darling. Well, you know, I, look, when that verdict came back not guilty, for me, I all of a sudden realized I had a moment of the emperor had no clothes. Because until that moment, I, too, was part of the media who was reporting only salacious elements of the trial. Now, part of that, in fairness to me, was that the Fox producers only wanted to hear certain things. So they would only have me on, like, on Pajama Day or on Macaulay Cullen Contest. I mean, they had me on a lot because they, yeah. every day there was something salacious. But they had the particular topics that they wanted me to address. So had I wanted to address something that was exculpatory or in Jackson's favor, that was not the subject matter agreed to prior to the interview. You know, all these things are, are discussed in advance. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, Macaulay Culkin was on today. We want to talk to you about his position and whether or not he said he was touched or not. But, you know, whatever the case may be. So, uh, you know, or Larry King was on or this one or that one, whatever it may be. So the the, the interviews are, are always kind of pre, pre-set. And so anything I was reporting from court was what, again, what Fox, what O'Reilly wanted to talk about. And what he wanted to talk about was anything that was going to make Jackson look guilty. So I, mean, I became part and parcel to that. I certainly at that time thought he was guilty. I didn't understand that this family was a family of grifters. I didn't understand what was really going on in that courtroom because I was so blinded by my preconceived notions that it wasn't until after the not guilty verdicts that I started to think, wait a minute. I was wrong, and I, the emperor has no clothes, and Tom Snedden has made a game of this whole thing. And these people are grifters, and they've been after every celebrity in the world, from Chris Tucker to George Lopez to Jay Leno. Everyone testified. Right. Right. And, and you know, they went after the biggest target in the world, Michael Jackson. And there was never any molestation there. That was a thing that Bashir drummed up in his documentary. And I think you see it in the video that I attached to the new book. Yeah. yeah that everybody felt duped. Yeah, and that was that was it's great. Everybody just so you know the new um the edition out now has uh extras on it and and one is the videos. Now the uh, watching that and Brashear, that was I I really didn't like uh his interview. I I thought it was terrible and I I'm s- still surprised Michael Jackson even did it. But that he Well, especially the one that I put on the, the new book. Yeah. Do you see how Kiss ass the sheer is with Michael. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm, that's only a very small sample of it. Let me tell you, that's highly edited. I, we saw in court two and a half hours of that outtakes. Mm. And let me tell you, for two and a half hours, you watch Martin Bashir telling Michael Jackson what a wonderful father he is and what a wonderful person he is and how he's going to help him bring this international children's holiday to the forefront. And that's what this whole documentary is about. And, you know, we want to help you with your vision. And you see little bits and pieces on it on the video that I did include where he says, oh, we're going to go to Africa and we're going to start. And Michael Jackson is sincerely believing Martin Bashir. Why? Because Bashir did the documentary on Princess Diana. And as you know, Michael was obsessed with fame, royalty. That's why he named his son Prince. That's what he wanted. He wanted to be a king of pop. He wanted, he married Elvis Presley, another king of rock and roll daughter, and he also knew Princess Diana, so to him, the whole British thing, the royal thing, this was the way to go. Bashir convinced him that, I'm going to do a documentary that's going to rehabilitate your career in every way and show all the good works that you've done for children all over the world. And you can see it, right, guys? Didn't you see it in the video? Fatten him up for the kill. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm really fattening him up. I mean, you couldn't believe it. Yeah, that was. It, but that, that you know, that was just terrible. To, to watch it, it's just. 
awful to watch him. Oh, you're the best father ever. And, and, you know, just that whole thing was just. It was a cringe video. Yeah. It was. It, it, it really makes you cringe to see Michael Jackson over and over again, and the way it's edited, you see him in in the the blue shirt and the red shirt, and how how Bashir followed him around for a year, and Jackson didn't get any money for it. Jackson didn't sign any contract for it. He just lets this guy carte blanche follow him around, and why? Because you could see it right there in that video, because the guy kept, you know. Telling him how he was, in his heart, the man who cared more about children than anyone else, and the busloads of children that came to Neverland, and, and how Michael was like a child, and he loved to be... I mean, you see the bits and pieces of it there. Yeah. You imagine two and a half hours of it? But at the same time, you can see where Bashir is getting the parts and bits and pieces that he needs for this kill video. Right, for the documentary. And the thing that I discovered from Brian Oxman, who is, you know, one of Jackson's family attorneys, is that, and from others, by the way, it wasn't only Brian Oxman, it was actually the accuser's mother who said this on their rebuttal tape that we saw in court over and over again, that Bashir is the one who suggested, first of all, that the Arvizo family come to Neverland because he wanted to show in the documentary somebody that, that Michael Jackson had helped cure. And it was between the kid whose name is David, who was burned in most of his body by his father, who I met on a Phil Donahue show many years ago. It was a horrifying tale. And, or this kid Arvizo, and they decided on Arvizo. That was all testified to in court. And they brought that family up there, and the family, you know, did the interviews, and you saw Michael. You'll see in the book the picture of Michael with, uh, with the wheelchair, um, you know, and his Gavin is being wheeled around Neverland with, by his brother, and Michael's walking with him with the umbrella. This was going on. This kid had no hair on his head. He was in a medically, uh, medically sealed room. He was brought to Neverland. Michael helped him. Uh, fight the cancer mentally. He held blood drives for the kid and all of that. And later, when he came back up two years later for the Bashir documentary, it was Bashir who suggested that they hold hands, that they sit on Michael's bed, and that they hold hands. That was Bashir's suggestion, according to Brian Oxman and according to the mother of the accuser who said it on tape. We have it. I have that tape where she says, let's hold hands the way... Um, Bashir told us to hold hands. Mm. So the optics. It it was about optics. He orchestrated that moment. Bashir. So that's it years. was completely orchestrated. And you know it because what, Michael Jackson's gonna be having sex with a kid who has no hair and is in a wheelchair? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Seriously? I mean, yeah. I mean no. But for sure, uh, the whole yeah, journalism I'm, point of that, I mean, you know, Diane Diamond, hard copy, uh, current affair, for sure, all that stuff. That was really kind of a, a trending thing at the time, right? That, well, now, yeah, now it's TMZ. And, yeah. Yeah, it yeah, well, it was, of course it was a trending thing. And it was a trending thing that you had no way to, like you do in these days with TMZ, you have social media where people can speak out or, you know, qualify things or they have their own cameras and they're taking videos and they can see then back then you had nothing but the word of these people right you had nothing but the uh, vision and an image that martin bashir wanted to present vis-a-vis his cameras yeah and that's kind of the problem i mean well and you have tom Nessero. he's um did the forward forward but he was also in the video and i know that he he commented a lot about the uh media conviction spin that's what he called it Mm-hmm. So this is all part of that same problem. Uh, this this is the uh, you know a conviction in in the public in the media, and you've got people like that, you know Diamond Brashear and all that kind of going around selling everything one way to people. The audience that's all they're getting. Well, here's the thing, as Nezra pointed out on that video that you see. This would have been a cottage industry. We talked about it at length. There would have been millions, if not billions of dollars to be made on selling stories about Michael Jackson in jail, 
Michael Jackson being visited by whatever relative in jail, Michael Jackson on suicide watch, Michael Jackson. The, think about it. As it was, there were millions and God knows how much made on the cottage industry of, of talking about allegations against him for, for, from Jordy Chandler on. But now, with a criminal trial and everybody in the world paying attention, if he had gone to prison, to jail, it would have been a rocket boom industry for those tabloid journalists. And they knew it. Yeah, yeah. And that was really, and, and, and like you said, we didn't, you didn't have the people running around with their cell phones and their own, getting their own videos and, and contributing. It was just whatever they show and tell you. Right. There was no check system. There was no balance, checks and balances. Do you, do it was all one-way reporting. Do you think, and that one way was against Michael Jackson. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, do you think that that actually makes a difference in the courtroom, but... You know, but in a courtroom. Yeah, the media. Like like when they when the media is all selling one thing to the actual jury, um, are they affected by it? Well, you know, in this case, when I talked to Mesro about the jury, whether or not he felt he could get a fair jury, you know, he said he went up to Santa Maria, he spent time in Santa Maria and realized that these were honest, hardworking people who could judge Michael Jackson as a peer and would be fair. And he felt them to be conservative-minded, which actually I lived up there for those six months. They are more conservative-minded in Santa Maria than any place like uh, Santa Barbara or Los Angeles, for example. So he felt he could get a fair trial there. He felt that the jury, and, and I was there for voir dire as well. You know, anyone who had biases or uh, thoughts or understood what the allegations were on that particular trial obviously weren't picked for the jury. Um, the people who were picked for the jury were people who hadn't been really paying attention to the particular news of that allegation. Everyone knew, and I don't think you had to be, you had to be living under a rock to not know that there were, had been allegations in the past oh, against Lord, Michael Jackson. Yes. But regarding that particular case and those accusers, those jurors did not know anything about it, and they listened with open mind to all that was presented. And believe me, the prosecution threw every charge they could at Michael Jackson, including a conspiracy to hold that family hostage at Neverland, which, by the way, that family, the mother was using Michael Jackson's Rolls Royce to go back and forth to Los Angeles while she was, quote, hostage. And there's no fences around Neverland. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it's 2,700 acres. You can go anywhere you want to go. So what are they talking about? They were being held hostage. And she's leaving via Rolls Royce and coming back, and she's going <laughs> into the town of Solvang not far away and getting her hair done and her nails done. And there were bills that were presented all throughout the trial, and we saw what she was doing. I mean, that's a hostage? That's the kind of hostage yeah. I like being. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the hostage I want to be, too, to get everything yeah. taken care of while they were trying to get this family to do a rebuttal video so that they could show the world that this Bashir thing was a hoax. That's why the family was there and, quote, being held hostage. They were taking complete advantage of Michael Jackson and the situation, and then they decided, oh, we're going to go for the big money. We're going to go to Larry Feldman, the same lawyer that Jordy Chandler used. We're not going to the police, by the way. We'll just go to the lawyer, which is what they did. Now, Aphrodite, sometimes it happens. I was held hostage at SeaWorld for three days one time because they kept <laughs> pushing me back inside the water to save my life. <laughs> but... Uh, I know. Well, you know, I get held hostage at the at the shopping mall quite often, especially in Bloomingdale's. It's amazing what happens to yeah, me in there. They don't let go of your credit card, yeah. <laughs> they don't. I mean, we're, we're 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 chuckling, but you bring up a good point. And um, how can you? And, and we've discussed this before, Al and I, and and even with you on, on other shows. How? Can we guarantee that you're going to get a fair jury when, okay, I didn't see these particular cases, but I do know that he's been accused of. I mean, we're talking about Michael Jackson. Uh, you know, well, I, and, that, and that's the thing. There was a huge gamble, and the media really thought, including me, that Jackson would get convicted of something because they threw so many charges at him, that he applied alcohol into these kids, that he did this, that he did that, that they... People figured that something would stick. 
and then he'd get convicted of something, and that they, they'd put him behind bars for some period of time. That's what people thought. Uh, and that certainly the prosecution, that's why they put 14 charges against Michael Jackson. Um, the thing is that at the end of the day, the jury saw through all the lies and the smoke and the mirrors. None of the testimony added up. And remember, this family had gone after J.C. Penney's with a lawsuit that started because they stole items. The kids stole from J.C. Penney's. And when the guards from J.C. Penney's in West Covina came after that family in the parking lot, the family, the mother of the accuser, Janet Arvizo, claimed that she was sexually molested by one of the J.C. Penney security guards. And this, and I swear to you, this is what she said, that he twisted her nipples 44 times. <laughs> what? Well, I don't know. On the parking lot asphalt of J.C. Penney's in West I, I count them. I don't know about you, but I count them. Oh. When it happens to me, I count it. Yes, yes, but, yes, yes, of course. When I get molested like that and my nipples are twisted, I, I sit and count. I know it's 40, 41 or if it's 31, whatever it is. Yeah. I know. And she knew. She knew. And we heard that testimony. We heard the testimony about her going to get full body waxes in the salon in Solvang while she was, quote, being held captive by Michael Jackson and his people. Um, you know, when you start to add it all together and you realize that those boys testified in the J.C. Penney lawsuit, those boys who stole the clothes that got them followed out into the parking lot to begin with, and that J.C. Penney settled with them and that they were at the same time collecting welfare and that they, she came forward with bruises that allegedly got, that was given to her by the guards, which didn't show up at the time of the arrest report or at the time of the incident, but showed up two days later because it turns out that her husband was a wife beater, which was proven and, and verified by court records and, and, you know, by criminal records. So I can say it. I'm not. I mean, David Arvizo was a was a uh, violent abuser. So all of those things came out in court, and you see this picture of this family. You start to see that there's nothing about what they're saying that's real. These kids were were groomed to lie and to steal and to manipulate the legal system and the J C Penney lawsuit was the proof of it. That this was more monetary. I, I, I think I can get some money out of this. You know, regardless, I, I'm going to get some money out of this. A lot of money. Because you remember when the Bashir documentary aired, the whole world was calling that our visa family. These are people, there are five people, a family of three kids and the husband and wife, living in a one-bedroom barrio in East L.A., they're living in a studio apartment. Now, they've got people like Chris Tucker, people like George Lopez, people like Jay, Jay Leno, everyone they've approached for money, and now they're with Michael Jackson, and they're getting blood drives, and they're going to Neverland, and everything is great, and they're getting monies, and they're collecting from welfare, and they're collecting from insurance, and they're collecting from the stars. And while all that's happening, once they did the documentary, and it airs, and now suddenly it looks like this kid was molested, when he wasn't, but Michael said, oh, yeah, we sleep on the bed. I give him the bed to sleep in, and I sleep on the floor, and we hold hands. The minute that came out, CBS, NBC, ABC, Larry King, 60 Minutes, the National Enquirer, you name it, was calling that barrio apartment. There were notes pinned to the door by every outlet that, could, that found out who they were and where they lived. And you think that that wasn't something that was tempted to them that they were probably offered 50 grand, 100 grand to give their story to the National Enquirer, and they're thinking they needed that money. But now they're thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's go to Michael, because if, they, if, if we're going to get paid that kind of money to tell our story, let's let Michael take care of us like he had been. So they go to Michael, they go to Neverland, they have the time of their lives, they're treated like kings and queens, and then... They decided to go to the lawyer of Jordy Chandler to say, oh, while we were there, now that we were treated like kings and queens and we made a rebuttal video saying nothing happened, actually, Gavin was molested three or four times or five or six times, whatever it was, we're not sure. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, a- Aphrodite, now now that we're here, let let me drop this bomb. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> here we go. I mean, I, I I've heard everything that you've had to say, and and mm-hmm. I was again, I was sympathetic to Michael. And hearing this information, why? And I understand there was a lot of cut, there was a lot of editing, but why did it seem like Michael Jackson did a lot of his own damage? He's not a stupid man. This is a man that made billions in in music. This is a man mm-hmm. that made billions in business and knew mm-hmm. how to market himself. Mm-hmm. Why? Why did he do? Things and continue to do things that would, in any anybody's view, make him look guilty. For example, he would say, "Well, there's nothing more natural than sleeping with children," mm-hmm. or, or you know, he's the one that actually brought up the, the the Jesus juice, which led to him, you know, okay, he gave these children alcohol. But I mean, mm-hmm. he he seemed to do a lot of his own damage. Well, you're you're absolutely right. He did. He contributed to his own damage, certainly when it came to um, being open about the idea that sleeping with children was was a good thing and not a bad thing, and, and, and the Jesus juice, all of that that you mentioned. Well, here's what I have to say, and, and, and holding blanket over the railing when he was with Martin Bashir, who got, yeah. were able to capture that for his documentary as well. All of the various things that Jackson did throughout his life, especially in the latter part of his life, when he was admittedly a, a person who was addicted to painkillers, when he was admittedly, you know, not entirely um, normal from the time of his childhood either. Um, Michael Jackson, you, know, you have to think about his view of the world. And it, it's almost impossible, but I have tried to view the world through Jackson's eyes because you know, I mean, you can't really, but if if you just think for a moment that you were a star as a five-year-old child or a six-year-old child, that you were on yeah. stage, I remember and that Jackson all time. you know is that you're on stage, and that you have a father, I've met Joe Jackson, who's an abusive, violent man, who's going to control you every which way he can, which he did, and that you're family's livelihood is dependent on you, because you're the main person in that Jackson 5. That's what he knew, that's what he grew up with. He grew up with his brothers all sleeping in the same bed. I've been to his house in Gary, Indiana, where he grew up. It's a teeny tiny place. The kids slept in the same rooms. They slept in the same beds when they were on the roads, for sure. He danced in nightclubs where the strippers would come on after he performed. They'd throw mm-hmm. money up on the stage, literally, and he'd collect it and go buy candy with it. This was his history. So, you know, to think about going through life with that as your starting point, where adults just want to use you, where adults just are there to get, collect your talent and then skew whatever it is you're doing to their liking. And then even when he went with Quincy Jones and he started his own career, solo career, he still had to appease and do what everybody else wanted him to do. Uh, of course, he then made standards for himself that were out of this world. But at some point, he was so interested in getting attention that he got was, was getting too much attention. And it was then that he started with the between the Pepsi commercial and the drugs and, and whatever it was to kind of just go off into his own world, that bubble of wearing the masks and having his kids in the masks and, you know, only wanting to be around children. And I can understand, you know, he had a sign, he had a, a dictate at Neverland to not allow anybody in his, his, on his property that were his family other than his mother. He was done with his family. He was done with most of the adult world. He he was done with it. Because think about his perspective. All he ever knew were people who wanted wanted a piece of him. Yeah, yeah he didn't trust the adults. I think he was um, naive. And just because you make a lot of money doesn't mean you're um, not naive and, and you're smart enough to avoid things like that. You've got two separate things. You've got a business sense and a, and a talent, right, that he was mm-hmm. able to make work. But then you've got a, an emotional self, and in his case, 
was the mentality of a 12-year-old yeah. who never grew up because he never had a childhood. He talked about it all the time, and we saw this in the outtake footage, where he said there was no Christmas, there was no birthdays, there was no Thanksgiving, there were no holidays because his mother was a Jehovah's Witness. True. So they didn't have any holidays. Can you imagine having to be forced to perform on stage all the time, traveling all the time, up at night, 3 o'clock in the morning, you're 5 years old, you're 8 years old, you're 10 years old, now you're on Soul Train, now you're here, now you're there, now you've got Joe Jackson threatening and beating you, and you've got Catherine, you're not allowed to have a, a, a Christmas, a present, a birthday, and anything. This is... Think about that combination. Guys, just think about that for a minute if that was your childhood. And I don't mean it as, 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 in a stupid way because, I mean, we all know that. But no. if you try to, try to really truly imagine that, that if you grew up that way, what would you be like? Yeah. It well, reminds me of the dog on the Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is no Christmas. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good uh, metaphor. I mean, the, yeah. you know, <laughs> the, I mean, the, the Peter Pan, didn't they call it the Peter Pan syndrome? Yeah, the Peter Pan syndrome. He didn't want to grow up because he he was always dictated to by adults, and he felt that the adult world was a scary, horrible place, and it he didn't want it. Yeah, I agree. it is. <laughs> I agree with him. You know, I, I, I'm almost feeling that way. Like I just want to stay in my place and not go anywhere. Listen, I tell you, think about this, too. Michael Jackson had gotten to a point where he could not move without paparazzi swarming all over him. That's why he started to wear those masks, yeah. no. you know, the, 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 the face things, right? Right, right? And then he put the mask on his kids, and the more he covered himself up, the more paparazzi followed and chased him. Yeah. So but like you've got to Diana, that. You've got to expect that, Aphrodite. But he did Let's expect it, but he got tired of it. He got tired of it, and that's why he wrote the song, Leave Me Alone. He was tired of it. He didn't want his children subjected to it. He had had it already with his life. Think about how you have no respite from it at all. Nothing. You've got to hide all the time. You can't walk out your door. I'll never forget he said in one of the outtake videos, uh, something in trial that we saw. They said, do you ever go to a supermarket and shop? And he said, no, I've never been to a supermarket. And they said, would you like to go? And he said, I, they, meaning Bashir, he said, I would love, I would love to go into a supermarket and get a cart and a wagon and just put some food in there. And I thought, what a weird, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? And And then, just so you understand, like my follow-up to that, I went to Los Olivos, you know, near Neverland is that town, and I went in there. It's a little supermarket, uh, like a, like a, not a supermarket, a, 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 a mart. What do you call it? A mini mart kind right. of place? Not with a gas station, just the mini mart. Yeah. And so I went in there because I figured, you know what? He lived up the road from here, three miles. Maybe he came into this place. We still filled in beer and whatnot, and you know, cakes and hostess cakes, whatever. So I went in. And I said to the guy, do you own this place? He said, yeah. And I said, so you know Michael? No, I didn't know him. Oh, okay. So then I stayed and hung around a little bit. I said, didn't he ever come? Did he ever come in here? And finally the guy says to me, he did actually come in here from time to time. And I said, really? Really, he did? And I said, so you saw him? He talked to you? He said, no, he always wore a, he always wore a mask when he came in. And I thought, oh, my God. He got totally cuckoo because this was a little tiny town where, yeah, he'd be recognized, but that little mini mart, believe me, there's no one going in it. I mean, this was after the trial when there were no people around. <laughs> yeah. Like, there was no one going in it, believe me. Yeah. It's not near the hotels or the little shops or anything. It was on the edge of town there. Why would he need to be in a mask to go in the mini mart to buy Twinkies? Well. But he felt he needed to. He, he turned into the caricature that, you know, the media portrayed because he didn't know, he, he didn't, he didn't, he just couldn't show his face anymore. He just, he was afraid. Yeah. He was not emotionally able to deal with it. I think that's it. I mean, he was like a child. It, it, can you imagine, seriously, I'm, I'll never forget that moment being in that mini mart. 
I'll, I'll, I just, you know, looking around, you, you're looking around, you're seeing these, you know, the, the cases of the beers and the sodas and the juices and the whatever, Yahoo drinks and whatnot, and, and you know, all the, you know, the cigarettes and whatever. And it's a tiny little store, and I'm thinking, you need to, and I'm trying to picture Michael in there wearing a mask. <laughs> like, he's, he's three miles from his house. There's no other store in here. He has to, wear, has to wear a mask? He can't just go in and get a soda? Well, yeah. No, they it's, couldn't. It's, yes, forever Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin always wears his mask when he goes to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> That's just so I don't scare people. Yeah, he's wearing his in Walmart because he doesn't want people to know. Oh, my God. Well, let me tell you something. Kate Spade, you know, just killed herself horrifyingly, yeah. and her husband came out of their New York City apartment wearing a mask. Oh, no. Like a costume mask, like oh, a plastic I, mask. Like he's the one that we should worry about. Like he's... Well, I think, I, 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 I think he why, took a note out you, of Jackson's playbook. I don't know. Well, I, I, I try not to get noticed, but you're going to get noticed wearing a mask. Cause wear a no, mask, he did, exactly. He, he got noticed, but he didn't want no one to talk to him. What are you going to do, talk to a plastic mask? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, you know, uh, like I said, uh, the, the adult world, I don't blame him, you know. Uh, just drinking my Jesus juice and... <laughs> well, I mean, like you say, he got himself into a lot of trouble. He got himself into a world of trouble by spending time with kids. And his manager said to him, you better stop hanging out with these kids because people talk and people, you know. And, and let's face it, the, the, the settlement with Jory Chandler, you know, that's a highly questionable thing. I think, you know, I, I don't know if we've talked about it before. I have my own thoughts. Michael Jackson fans want to say that Michael was innocent of everything, always and ever, forever. I can't go that far, yeah. and Jackson fans won't like that, but I don't know. I wasn't in his bed. I don't know what transpired between him and any of the young boys that he spent a lot of time with. I can tell you when Colleen Culkin testified that nothing ever happened. I can tell you that Robson testified that nothing ever happened. I can tell you that we heard from many kids that said nothing ever happened, but we also heard from others that said something did happen, but it was always maybe touching up by the genes. It was, it was very... Uh, murky, the way kids describe this. You never heard any kid say, I was, I was raped. Right. You never heard any kid say anything like what you hear in a Sandusky trial or anything like you hear <laughs> even in a Cosby trial where, you know, I woke up and I was drugged and I woke up and, and you know, there was, you know, physical bodily fluid on me. You never heard anything like that about Michael Jackson. So right. when I say I, I can't go with the entirety of him being an innocent person, I don't know. I can only go with what I saw and where I was and the fact that, you know, this guy was so, you know, like you say, naive. Yeah. Naive, goofy. Um, you know, you go inside Neverland, you look inside Neverland, there's some of those pictures in the book, and you see Goofy and Donald Duck and upside-down mannequins and, and, and mannequins everywhere and, and, and wacko things that are all over the house. Mixed in with the marble statues and the, the the fine you know artwork and everything else, and you think, what in the world was he doing? Well, you know, he was a child. He had all this money in the world. He was living on a twenty seven hundred acre estate, and yet and he felt the need to bring in a zoo. He felt the need to have the chimpanzees with him. He had bubbles. He had whatever. All this craziness going on. And you look at those pictures and you start seeing the stacks and the piles and the you know in his bedroom and you see t big teddy bears on his bed. I mean, this is not the stuff of molesters. This right. is the stuff of a person who never grew up. Yeah, and that's kind of my thought. I I think he was a big kid and he was naive and uh I think he was also trying to hold on to that childhood because he was becoming 50, right? And um it's yep. it's, it's something we all deal with, but it's not I I don't think he ever grew up and he was in a 50-year-old body. Absolutely, he never grew up. He yeah. never grew up. Yeah. Never. And that's why he was in a financial Straits that he was in when he was getting ready to do that tour, This Is It, and that's why he called it This Is It, because he didn't really have the physical strength to do it. But he needed to save Neverland. So in order to save Neverland, because he was spending $2.3 million a month on all his security and his staff and all these interlopers and hanger-oners and people that were sucking him of every penny, and of course he spent money like mad. 
And so he had, even though he had a Sony catalog, he had such expenses that he didn't understand all that. Yeah. He had no, there was nobody to stop cap anything. Yeah. You know? So he didn't, he, he lived like a child as well. Like he made money and it was just, oh, I'll just make more money. It's all good. I can, you know, I'll, who cares? You know, somebody will fix the books. Yeah, they were fixing it, right? They were stealing left and right anything they could. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. making an accusation, a like blanket accusation. I don't know who took what that he spent two and a half million dollars a month on what, but I mean, he spent it on Twinkies at the corner store. At Twinkies. (laughs) I mean, it's really crazy. It's really crazy that he had such genius, such talent, and the ability to see getting the Sony catalog, which was brilliant. But he also lived like an absolute child, whether it was just eating ice cream and watching movies and being goofy on rides or going up in his tree where he wrote his songs. I mean, the whole thing, when you think about it, you think, how crazy of a life did this person lead? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not much different than mine. No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I always go up in my tree. Yeah. Whenever I'm, 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 when I decide that I'm going to write a new book, I'm yeah. going to climb the big tree in my backyard here, yeah. and I'm going to sit up in it like Michael did, and I'm going to just get, you know, all my ideas. That's what because, I do. And he did do that. He did do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, uh, n- now, one other thing just so, before we run out, I know that um, on it you have part of the uh, child testimony as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, and and... His police interview. Yeah. Yeah. And and I really, um, I really kind of agree with what you're saying. I I think that, uh, and and how do I say it? He he almost tried to make him, uh, like you couldn't, you didn't really believe him. The accuser. Yeah. I, I I didn't believe him. I mean, I know there are people that argued when we saw the entirety of the video, and there were people who argued, and without even seeing it, that say, you know, kids when they're being interviewed by police aren't going to seem believable because if they've been molested, you know, that's a kid and they're not going to seem believable. But there was something about the way he said it. He grabbed me. Almost It was coach. like, it seemed coach. It, it seemed rehearsed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's what the jury thought. That's what the jury thought. I mean, you see that in the interview where the foreman says it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, and they got to see the full interview. We only, you know, I only put a snippet there, but it's enough of a snippet to say to yourself, you know, and this is this is a little bit uh, overly, uh, you know, dramatic or overly, what's the word, gross. I don't know how to say it, but, you know, this kid was asked if he knew what his ejaculation was during that police interview, and he hesitated. Like he didn't know. Yeah. And when he did that, that's when I turned to the court reporter and I said, do you have kids? And she said, yeah. I said, does this make any sense to you? She said, no. I said, okay. Kind of a, the the whole thing seems a little, a little strange to me. I, I don't, I, I don't know. And 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 you had the uh, foreman, Jerry Foreman, on there as well, and he's talking about what <laughs> that grandma that came in right after they. Um, got done with the trial and uh, before mm-hmm. the, and she just s- slammed her hands on the table and said he's guilty mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah that was the older woman on the jury and, and she had made up that made that decision before they ever deliberated so they had to he had to go to the judge and say look at you know what do we do because now we have a juror who doesn't want to deliberate and so they came back and he came All back things. and said no they didn't get an alternate she she agreed that she would deliberate what the evidence was so actually, you know, technically, had Nezero known that at the time, I'm sure that would have been a big stink. But as it turned out, it was between the judge and the foreman, and they let her stay on because she agreed that, you know, you, you signed up to deliberate the evidence. You can't just have decided this before you got on the jury. So she deliberated, and she ultimately came to the not guilty verdicts yeah. on 10 counts. Yeah. That was lucky. But- uh, lucky, L- uh, yeah, Al, you're right. Lucky, yeah. but how can they do that, Aphrodite? I mean, this woman has already made up her mind. Okay, well, you agreed to deliberate. Big deal. You've already told us. You, you've already right, given right. us a, a state of mind. 
I would have went with an alternate juror and said, at least this would appear to be more fair. Well, I don't think they knew. I don't think that was something that was known at the time. He went to the judge, and the judge, by the way, Melville, was partial, in my opinion, to seeing Michael Jackson convicted. I know that because I had to get the court order from him for the evidence, and I went to see him in chambers. And from what his tone was, let me put it that way, he's, and I, I, I hate to say this, speak about the dead, he's gone now, but his tone was everything but letting me know that he had wished that Michael Jackson had been found guilty. And from his rulings, even in court, and his demeanor, I felt, while he tried to hide it, that there was a favorability to the prosecution from the judge. So, you know, all of that taken together, you know, you start to think, yeah, the jury foreman probably went to the judge and said, this woman banged her head on the table, and said she, and the judge said, look, just go back and tell her to deliberate without going to the counsel. Obviously, had Mesro heard that, he would have thrown a pitch fit. Yeah. She wow. would have been off. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. After 80, it's been a, an hour already. We could just go on forever, <laughs> but they won't allow, they won't allow us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, well, you know, it's a pleasure talking with you guys. You're really smart, and you really have great insights, and I appreciate your time, too. Well, we appreciate you. And uh, now the book, the special edition is out now, and you can get it at um, all fine bookstores. And Amazon. Well, Amazon. Amazon. It's an e-book. It's only an e-book. Oh, it's only an e-book. It's on Amazon. And you can yeah. also go to your website, you know, AphroditeJones.com, uh, which we have that all linked up. On our website as well, so convenient. Awesome. Well, well thank, thank you. you. Thank I you appreciate very much. that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I hope people get a new understanding about this thing because it's it's really something, right? Yeah. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com.